Welcome to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada's webcast, COVID-19, Current Knowledge on Prevention of Complications. As we learn about life with COVID-19, the scientific community is working to develop better solutions. The development of treatments has improved the prevention of complications that can lead to hospitalizations. In this presentation, Mark Gernart, Director of the Provincial Oncology Drug Program at Cancer Care Manitoba, We'll discuss the latest protective treatments available in Canada to prevent hospitalizations. Let me introduce myself. My name is Catherine Yerkew, and I am the Community Services Lead for Saskatchewan and Manitoba with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society of Canada. I will be the moderator of this online event. Since there are many of you, we invite you to type your question and comments in the question box of your Zoom webinar panel throughout the presentation. An LLSC staff member will monitor the questions. I will read some of your questions aloud at the end of the presentation during the question and answer period. Due to the large number of participants and limited time, we may not be able to answer all of your questions. Also note that our speaker cannot answer specific questions about a person's health status. Case-specific questions will not be read aloud during the question and answer period. If we do not get to your question during the live presentation, a community service lead will contact you directly after the webinar. Today's presentation is recorded, therefore you can listen to it again on our website. Okay, and we're at the correct slide. If you have a lot of questions right now, or you cannot find what you're looking for, you can talk to our community services lead in your area and receive personalized information and in finding answers to your questions or ways to address your concerns. The community services leads are here to help. Reach out to us by calling toll-free 1-833-222-4884. Next slide, please. We invite you to visit our new website, bloodcancers.ca. Our goal is to better serve the community and offer an improved experience. On our website, you will find all our past website recordings, our podcast channel, information sheets, practical tools to help you navigate the cancer experience. We have also added a new section featuring COVID-19 and blood cancers information. Visit bloodcancers.ca to read more. Next slide, please. It is now time to introduce today's speaker. Mark Gernard. Mark graduated with his Bachelor of Sciences in Pharmacy degree in 2002 from the University of Manitoba and has been working at Cancer Care Manitoba since 2003. He is the Director of Provincial Oncology Drug Program at Cancer Care Manitoba since 2014. His area of interest include the implementation of new treatments for solid tumor and hematological cancers and implementation of biosimilars. Thank you for being here today, Mark. Over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada to invite me to present today. Um, in terms of disclosures, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Six of the COVID-19 virus. And then after that, we'll shift our attention to the overview of vaccination against COVID-19. And then we'll talk about pre-exposure prevention treatment. And then also post-exposure prevention treatments, which are listed here. So let's just start with a basic um, introduction of COVID-19 definition. So COVID-19 is an infection caused by SARS-CoV-2, which is a virus of the coronavirus family. And what we know is viruses in the coronavirus family can cause disease in animals and humans. The way COVID-19 spreads among humans is through direct contact with secretions, airborne particles such as talking, breathing, sneezing, coughing, and surfaces contaminated with secretions. 
When we look at the epidemiology on March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a global pandemic. And when we look at the number of cases worldwide, there was over 626 million cases worldwide, with just over 6.5 million deaths. When we look at Canada specifically up to October 10, 2022, there was over 4.2 million cases, and in terms of deaths, 45,394. So in terms of its mechanism of action, it's important to understand this because a lot of the new treatments are directed against the S protein. So COVID-19 uses its spike, which is also known as the S protein. And what it does is it, it attaches to human cells and then penetrates and infects the human cells. So the S protein is the target of many treatments in which we will be discussing today. So we may, you may have heard of the waves of COVID-19 variants in Canada, and the virus can mutate into different variants that have different disease contagiousness, severity of symptoms, and responses to treatment. So you'll see here different colors represent the different variants that have occurred since 2020, January 2021, all the way to April of 2022. The most recent in 2022 were the Omicron variants, which are highlighted here in pink, uh, various shades of pink. So this uh, this uh, graph, you'll see the here in January of 2022 is where we saw the fifth and sixth waves by Omicron, and those were the highest peaks um, of the COVID-19 that are just depicted on this graph. Now, when we look at the signs and symptoms of the Omicron variant, the symptoms can range from mild to severe, and they may last for varying lengths of time, but usually resolve within 14 days. Some people can develop what we call long COVID-19. When we look at the most common symptoms, so those are symptoms that are usually present in greater than 50% of patients who uh, had COVID-19, runny nose, sneezing, sore throat, and headache are common symptoms. Less common symptoms that are usually present in less than half of patients are persistent cough, joint pain, chills, fever, dizziness, muscle pain, gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, diarrhea, and abdominal pain, hoarseness, or loss or change of sense of taste or smell. And rarely, so that means in less than 10% of patients, some symptoms that may occur are swollen glands, chest pain, irregular heartbeat, shortness of breath, skin changes, delirium, or confusion. So now we're going to turn our attention to the vaccination. So the objectives for the vaccine is to reduce the incidence of the disease and the spread of the virus within the general population. And it's also to try to prevent severe disease and death. Active immunization stimulates the immune system to produce antibodies against the virus. So COVID-19 is active immunization. And as targeted groups, um, infants under six months, pregnant women, and immunocompromised individuals. So now we're going to do some question and answers to help uh, with the most common questions that arise with regards to COVID-19. So the first question that we often get are, are COVID-19 vaccines safe? And the answer to this is yes. Health Canada makes sure that all required steps are followed before approving a vaccine. And the vaccines are subject to same rigorous scientific standards, quality standards, testing, and post-marketing surveillance as any new vaccine approved in Canada would be. This is a um, this is a slide that was used from uh, Quebec, so it is in French. But you'll see here the take-home message is the vaccination is the most effective way to prevent infection hospitalizations and death from COVID-19. The first um, picture on the left-hand side is the number of cases. In the middle is hospitalizations and to the right-hand side, deaths. And what you'll notice here is that those who are non-vaccinated, which is the ones in the gray graph, have a higher number of cases of COVID-19, higher rates of hospitalization, 
and deaths due to COVID-19. When you look at the right-hand side of each of the graphs, those are the ones that had um, the primary uh, and two boosters uh, administered. So in terms of available vaccines, messenger RNA, or also better known as mRNA vaccines against COVID-19 should be given priority. If the inactivated vaccines are used, an additional dose of the mRNA vaccine should be administered. I won't go through all these vaccines, but here are some examples. I think the most common that we probably that you may have heard of are the mRNA vaccines of, from Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech. Um, but there are other vaccines here listed. So let's just talk a little bit about mRNA vaccines and how they work. So um, in number one is basically the vaccine. So these the vaccine consists of fragments of mRNA that are wrapped in lipid bubbles. And then this is administered. And after the mRNA vaccine is injected, it is entered into our cells. And then if you look at number three, there's a spike protein building. So there's something in our cells called ribosomes, which are cells that are protein factories. And what they do is they read the mRNA and build spike proteins. And then the mRNA is then quickly destroyed. And lastly, but most importantly, is that an immune response is then uh, detected. So immune cells spot the spike proteins, lock onto them, and produce antibodies. And this is important. Just to note, messenger RNA does not enter the nucleus of the cell and cannot reproduce itself. It cannot change the recipient's genetic code either. Another common question we get is, I have had a mild to moderate allergic reaction to an mRNA vaccine. Can I still get another dose? The answer to this is yes. A mild to moderate reaction, such as swelling at the injection site, should not prevent you from receiving another dose of an mRNA vaccine. There are no special precautions that are recommended in this situation. Another common question is I've had a severe allergic reaction to an mRNA vaccine. Can I get a different type of vaccine against COVID-19? So this is a good question. The answer to this is yes. So if you've had a severe allergic reaction to an mRNA vaccine, sometimes the reactions are to what's in the vaccine, such as polyethylene glycol or another ingredient called trometamol. And these are just examples. So you can get a different type of COVID-19 vaccine, but one that is not an mRNA vaccine. So it works differently. Another common question is, how many vaccines doses should an Im immunocompromised person get? So the initial vaccination is three doses and usually four weeks between each dose. And same schedule if previously infected with COVID-19. So someone who's previously been infected would go through the same schedule. In terms of a booster shot, three months after the last vaccine dose or four weeks after infection. Additional doses may be required for those that are age 12 and over and immunocompromised. And this would happen three months after a booster shot or four weeks after infection. Something that also we hear uh, sometimes is, should a person who's had hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or stem cell transplant be revaccinated against COVID-19? So the answer is yes. So a hematopoietic stem cell transplant, or also known better as stem cell transplant, usually re results in a loss of existing immunity. Therefore, a person who has had such a transplant should be considered as never having been vaccinated. The vaccine schedule will be assessed by the healthcare team at the transplant center starting three to six months after the transplant, regardless of how many COVID-19 vaccine doses the person has received previously. Another common question that we get is, should a person who's had CAR T cell immunotherapy for cancer be revaccinated against COVID-19? The answer to this is yes. So 
Cancer immunotherapy with CAR T cells may lead to the loss of immunity acquired through previous vaccination. Therefore, a person who has received such treatment should be considered as never having been vaccinated. This is just an example from Quebec, but they recommend getting revaccinated against COVID-19 three to six months after such therapy, regardless of how many COVID-19 vaccine doses the person has received previously. So the team for CAR T cell therapy would discuss this with the patients at the time that they would be um, scheduled to receive these doses, for example. So let's look at the current COVID-19 context. So the most important is barriers in vaccination are the best means of prevention against COVID-19. People who are immunosuppressed may have a suboptimal response to vaccination, putting them at greater risk of complications such as poor response to the disease, persistent infection, and treatment failure if hospitalized. Examples of those who may be immunosuppressed are depicted here in pictures. So those with hematological cancers, those patients undergoing chemotherapy, those who've had an organ transplant, dialysis patients, those patients who are on immunosuppressive drugs, and also patients with primary immunodeficiency. So now we'll turn our attention to pre-exposure prevention with Evisheld. So pre-exposure prevention of COVID-19 disease in adults and adolescents who have not been recently infected with SARS-CoV-2. And Evisheld would be indicated for that indication, as, but patients also have to have compromised immunity and are unlikely to have a satisfactory immune response to vaccination or for whom vaccination against COVID-19 is not recommended. This drug is not a substitute for vaccination, but may provide additional protection. So there's a picture of what Evisheld uh, looks like in Canada. So how does Evisheld work? So it's called what it's works base, basically what we call passive immunization, immunization through the injection of two antibodies. So in the middle, you'll see Evisheld has, is composed of two antibodies. And what it does is it targets the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And what that does is when the Evisheld targets the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, it then prevents the virus to attach to our cells in, our, in humans, and that is inhibited. Therefore, no replication of the virus can occur. So Evisheld is administered by a uh, in the muscle, so intramuscular injection. There's two separate injections and usually into each buttock muscle or thigh. And patients are usually monitored for at least 30 minutes after the injection, just to make sure that there are no side effects that occur from the injection. There are precautions that we do look at. So for individuals at high risk of a cardiovascular or thrombo thromboembolic event, individuals under age 18 or pregnant women. It's important that the clinic team knows about any history of allergic reactions to any medications or previous vaccines. And it's also recommended to wait 14 days after the last COVID-19 vaccine dose before getting Evisheld. And this medication is, a, is stored in the fridge. So the trial that looked at Evisheld was a trial called Provent trial. I'll briefly just review the trial. So these were patients who were ages 18 and over and had increased risk of inadequate response to vaccination and an increased risk of having a COVID-19 infection. So patients were randomized to receive Evusheld or placebo or basically nothing. And the main endpoint was to look at symptomatic disease and it had to be confirmed by a positive test between Evusheld administration and approximately six months or day 183 after the injection. You'll see here that by day 83, those who received Evisheld had a 77% decreased risk of catching COVID-19 as compared to placebo or those who received placebo. And by day 183, that risk was less uh, decreased to 83%. Important to note that there was no severe disease or death in the patients who received Evisheld. 
One of the common questions we get is in terms of safety of Evusheld. So when looking at Evusheld versus placebo, the number of patients who received or who experienced one or greater side effect was about 35% in Evusheld. Placebo is about 34.2%. The reaction at the injection site was about 2.4% in those who received Evusheld and the cardiac side effects was less than 1%. So 14 participants experienced a cardiac side effect from Evusheld. So one of the things that we um, often will say in clinics is to seek attention if onset of signs and symptoms of a cardiovascular or thromboembolic event occur. This is just an example from Quebec in terms of eligibility criteria for Evusheld. Uh, every province has established criteria, so it's important to see which, uh, what are the criteria, but it should be similar across the provinces. Uh, patients ages 18 and over who are severely immunosuppressed regardless of vaccination status and who are undergoing active treatment for a solid tumor or hematological cancer deemed highly immunosuppressive by the attending physician or CAR-T or chimeric antigen receptors T-cell therapy or hematopoietic stem cell transplant until complete immune reconstitution, as well as those patients with primary immunodefic immunodeficiency on immunoglobulin replacement therapy. The other uh, criteria here is no vaccination against COVID-19 or incomplete initial vaccination for medical reasons such as allergy and no alternative and at least one risk factor for developing complications from COVID-19. So age 60 or over, or patients who are age 18 or over with at least one chronic health problem. So a really good question comes up is, how do I know if I'm eligible to get Evisheld? So one of the things you could do is ask your pharmacist or physician. They should be able to direct you with the appropriate answer. Uh, if you are eligible, your pharmacist or physician can prescribe Evisheld, um, and Evisheld is 100% free of charge for those who are eligible. A really good question is, I am not sure if my treatment is immunosuppressive. What should I do? So you can contact your oncology team to discuss this, as it is not urgent for you to get Evisheld but they should be able to direct you if your current treatment that you are receiving is immunosuppressive. Where can I get an Evisheld injection? So this may vary by uh, provinces. Nurses are usually the ones who administer Evisheld injections. There are some pharmacies that do this as well. There's also in some hospitals, some specialized departments that can give Evisheld. And there's other locations dependent on the province. So check with your local clinics. They should be able to direct you in where this can be administered. Really good question as well. I have COVID-19 symptoms. Can I take Evusheld? So first off, you would need to confirm whether you have COVID-19. The reason is the interval between a recent infection and the administration of Evusheld should be eight days or when the infection has resolved. If you do not have COVID-19, for example, and you have a cold or the flu, it is best to wait until you have recovered from the infection to avoid confusion between the symptoms of the infection and possible side effects. I have recently been exposed to COVID-19, but I have no symptoms. Can I take Evisheld? So before getting Evisheld, it's important that you make sure that you do not have COVID-19. So always that's the first step. If you have no symptoms after eight days, you can consider taking Evisheld. It is recommended to wait at least eight days though after the exposure. If you develop symptoms, get tested to confirm whether you have COVID-19. So this is a really good question as well. So I have already had COVID-19. Should I still take Evisheld? Yes. 
Uh, Evisheld is not contraindicated in people who have had COVID-19 in the past, especially if they caught COVID-19 during the first waves, so in 2020-21, for example. Uh, the interval between a recent infection and the administration of Evisheld should be eight days or when the infection has resolved. And also consider waiting two to three months after infection before getting Evisheld. This is not mandatory, but should be discussed with your clinic team. Another question that's often that we receive is how long will I be protected after I receive the Evisheld injection? So it takes about six hours for people to achieve the minimum protective concentration after they have received Evisheld. Another good question, is it necessary to get an Evisheld booster shot? The answer is no. A booster shot of Evisheld is not recommended at this time. Evisheld stays in the body for a long time, so it is believed to be effective for 6 to 12 months, and Evisheld is effective for at least 6 months. This is always uh, evolving, so it's always best to have these discussions with your clinic because the evidence is changing all the time, but this is what the current status would be. So now we're going to talk about post-exposure treatment, and we're going to start with a drug which some of you may have heard called Paxlovid. So Paxlovid is a, for the treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 disease in adults who have tested positive and are at high risk for the disease to become severe. And what's really important is that Paxlovid must be taken within five days of the onset of symptoms. Paxlovid is not approved for use in patients with severe or critical COVID-19 disease that requires hospitalization. So the way Paxlovid works is this combination of antivirals that basically blocks viral replication or the multiplication of the virus in the body. In terms of some important features of Paxlovid, it is an oral medication that consists of two tablets of one antiviral called Nermatrelvir and one tablet of an antiviral called Ritonavir. And this is taken, three tablets are taken twice a day with or without food for a total of five days. If someone misses their dose by less than eight hours, then they should take the tablets as soon as possible and continue with the usual schedule. If that missed dose is more than eight or more hours from when it is due, then it's advised to skip that dose and take the next dose at the scheduled time. In terms of precautions, pregnant women, individuals under age 18, and kidney problems. So it's really important that the clinic team have a recent um, value of your kidney function. This is usually done by blood test, just to make sure that no adjustments in the dose need to be made for Paxlovid. In terms of contraindications are those who should not get Paxlovid, for example, those with a history of severe allergic reactions to the components, uh, severe kidney or and severe liver problems. I think one of the main things, if you're going to remember anything about Paxlovid, is that it has many drug interactions, and it's very important that your care team ha and a pharmacist have a complete medication list, including prescription, non-prescription, and herbal therapy, for example, that someone is taking in order to make sure that this is safe for Paxlovid to be prescribed to them. And the other thing is this medication is stored at room temperature. Just a little bit of background on the Paxlovid trial and why it got approved. So this was a trial called EPIC-HR, and the patients were aged 18 and over, and patients had mild to moderate COVID-19 symptoms for five days or less, and had a high risk of complications. And patients rather received Paxlovid or placebo. And the main endpoint of the trial was looking at the efficacy. So what I mean by that is the combination of COVID-19 related hospitalization or death from any cause through day 28. So you'll see here that placebo is in blue at the top and the red is the combination of Paxlovid. 
So lower is better in this case. So it, by day 28, there was an 89% decrease in hospitalizations or deaths from patients who received Paxlovid compared to those who had placebo. And one of the important things as well is that there was no deaths in the Paxlovid group. What about side effects? So what is the safety profile of Paxlovid? Some patients may experience metallic taste in the mouth, so that occurred in about 6% of patients. In diarrhea, occurred in about 3% of participants, and then blood pressure and muscle pain about 1%, but generally well tolerated. Those who are eligible to receive Paxlovid are, are, do receive it free of charge. Now I'm just gonna go over some of the main questions that we receive with regards to Paxlovid. So can I take Paxlovid if I'm vaccinated against COVID-19? So the answer is individuals who are immunocompromised are eligible for Paxlovid regardless of their vaccination status. So that's important. And in, individuals who are immunocompetent and have been vaccinated are not eligible for Paxlovid unless advised otherwise by a physician. Another common question that we get is, I've already taken Evisheld. Can I take Paxlovid? So the answer is yes. Pre-exposure prevention treatment does not prevent post-exposure treatment. So that's important. Now let's do the vice versa. So I've already taken Paxlovid. Can I then take Evisheld or be given Evisheld? The answer to that is yes, but you have to wait at least eight days after the infection or for the infection to be resolved. You could wait two to three months after infection before getting Evisheld, but this is not required. That's something to have a conversation with the clinic team about. Something we sometimes have received as a question is, if I take Paxlovid and do not feel better, can I take it for another five days for a total of 10 days, for example? The answer to that is no. The Paxlovid treatment is indicated for five days only. Taking Paxlovid for an additional five days is not recommended at this time. Another really good question is, I've already taken Paxlovid and I caught COVID-19 again. Can I take Paxlovid again? The answer to that is actually yes. There is no reason why you cannot take Paxlovid again for subsequent COVID-19 infections if you are still eligible. It's important to follow the recommendations of your pharmacist or physician uh, with regards to this. Another common question, I have had symptoms of COVID-19 for more than five days. Can I take Paxlovid? No. So Paxlovid should be taken within five days or less of the onset of symptoms or a positive test, but you always use whichever is longer. So the onset of symptoms or positive test, whichever is longer of the two. So I'm a pharmacist by training, so this one's really uh, important to me. Uh, so I'm taking other drugs. Can I take them along with Paxlovid? So your pharmacist will review your file to make sure that all drugs are compatible. It's very important they have a complete, accurate list of prescription, non-prescription, and herbal medications that uh, anyone is taking who's getting prescribed Paxlovid. If you are taking any drugs that prevent you from taking Paxlovid and you are eligible, the healthcare professional will refer you to a specialist at the hospital, potentially for alternative treatment. Now we're going to talk about post-exposure prevention with Evisheld. So before we talked about pre-exposure, so now we're going to talk about post-exposure, so someone who's had COVID-19 just recently. So the Evisheld is indicated for treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 disease in adults who have tested positive and are at high risk for the disease to become severe and must be taken within seven days of the onset of symptoms and it's used when Paxlovid cannot be taken. It must be administered in a healthcare facility because it is a medication that requires to be given in the muscle, as well as to be observed for 30 minutes after the injection is given. 
Another drug that is uh, you may have heard of is a drug called citrovimab. Um, so that's also indicated for post-exposure treatment. This one is indicated for treatment of individuals who tested positive for COVID-19, have had mild to moderate symptoms for five days or less, and are hospitalized due to COVID-19. It's also used when Paxlovid cannot be taken. This is also a medication that must be administered in a healthcare facility, and I'll go over why that is in a moment. So the reason why is because it is an intravenous infusion as a single intravenous infusion that's given over 60 minutes. In terms of side effects, monitoring of infusion related reactions for at least one hour. So by infusion related reactions, we mean chills, fever, kind of like flu like symptoms that some patients may experience after getting infusions. There are very few side effects, usually less than the placebo group, but sometimes patients can experience nausea, diarrhea, or headaches, so it's important that those be known to the clinic team if they occur. In terms of precautions, infusion-related reactions is something that needs to be looked at for this medication, and also caution in pregnant women. In terms of contraindications, a history of severe allergic reactions. This drug is unlikely to interact with other drugs, and this drug is stored in the fridge. Lastly, post-exposure treatment with a drug called Veclury, or also known as remdesivir. So you may have heard remdesivir um, instead of Veclury. So this is indicated for treatment of individuals who tested positive for COVID-19, have had mild to moderate symptoms for seven days or less, and are not hospitalized due to COVID-19. It's also used when Paxlovid cannot be taken. This is also a medication that is administered in a healthcare facility. So this drug is given in the vein or intravenously um, over three days total. So a higher dose in the first day and then two more doses for a total of three days. In terms of side effects, we the nurse will monitor for infusion-related reactions for at least one hour after the infusion usually. Nausea, headache, and rash can occur, as well as inflammation of the liver. So your blood will be monitored for liver tests to make sure that everything is okay there. In terms of precautions, infusion-related reactions, pregnant women, kidney and liver problems as well need to be looked at. Just like the other medications we talked about, anybody with a history of severe allergic reaction should make sure their clinic team is aware so they can assess if this medication is safe or not to be given. This medication is unlikely to interact with other drugs and is also stored in the fridge. So in terms of summary and most important, uh, barriers in vaccination are the best means of prevention against COVID-19 and its complications. There are pre and post exposure prevention treatments that are available for patients at high risk of COVID-19 implications, sorry, complications, sorry. And I suggest that uh, the clinic team have that discussion. Um, if there is, if there, you are eligible, they will would be discussing this with you. Uh, Post-exposure treatments should begin promptly, and it's always important to follow the instructions of your healthcare team uh, with regards to the treatments. And with that, I'll turn it over back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. That was very, very, um, very knowledge, very knowledgeable educate um, information about that. Um, thanks for sharing your expertise and insight with all of us. Um, again, um, learned a lot here today. Um, it's now time for our question and answer period. If you haven't um, done so already, please be sure to use the Q and A box in your Zoom webinar uh, panel to type your questions. As we mentioned earlier, due to the large number of participants and limited time, um, we are not able to get to all of your questions today. Also note that our speaker cannot answer specific questions about a person's health status. Um, this is not a private consultation. 
If we do get to ask your question during the live presentation, if we do not get to ask your um, answer your question during the live presentation, a community services lead will contact you directly after the webcast. So I'm just going to um, move into some of the questions here right now, uh, Mark. Um, what's the COVID vaccine effectiveness for those on maintenance therapies? So that's a really good question. Um, I'm assuming here we're talking about maintenance therapies such as maintenance rituximab or maintenance obinutuzumab probably is um, what I'm thinking here. So um, I think the clinic, the clinic teams will usually recommend that the COVID, if you're eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine, that they should still be administered. They will be directing probably more so the timing of the vaccine in relation to when your next maintenance dose would be due. Um, but they would be discussing this with you. It depends on the maintenance treatments. Some of them do suppress your immune system. So the effectiveness may not be as good, but it would be better than not getting anything at all in most instances. So the clinic team should be discussing this with you in terms of the timing um, of this of the COVID-19 vaccine in relation to when the next dose of the maintenance is due. Great, thank you. Uh, which blood cancer subtypes are more susceptible to COVID? That's a very good question. It's probably, I think, I think anyone who's getting active treatment are the ones who are probably at highest risk, especially those who are receiving um, chemotherapy or those who've had a recent stem cell transplant or CAR T cell therapy. And um, those would be the ones who'd probably be at most risk. We also know that patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia or CLL also have their just their disease itself can sometimes lower their immune system. So those would probably be the ones I would say would be the most. Perfect. Thank you. So how long has someone considered immunocompromised after treatment? Excellent question. Um, so uh, I would say it depends on the treatment that the individuals received. So a really good example is something like, you know, maintenance rituximab, for example, that can suppress the immune system for a little bit. Uh, chemotherapy does, it, everybody's a little bit different in terms of how long it takes to recover from, you know, some of the side effects that uh, may occur. But I, one of the things I probably say is it's a, it's a good question to have with the clinic team with regards to when your treatment has ended in terms of the necessary precautions. I think what I would say is that, you know, wearing masks at least for, you know, three to six months after the treatment's done is, is probably a good idea. Um, th those were, but at least to also have the conversation with the clinic team, because it's a good question, because it'll vary by the treatment that's received. It's a very good question, though. Excellent. Uh, so another question here about um, immunocompromised. What is the difference between immunocompromised and immunosuppressed, or are they the same thing? I think they're used interchangeably. I think so. I think what we when we use the word immunosuppressed, we think about somebody who's on you know getting um, medications for immuno that are receiving immunosuppressants. So things like tacrolimus, cyclosporin, those are what we call immunosuppressants. Immunocompromised, you're not necessarily receiving treatment or an immunosuppressant if you're immunocompromised. Um, so, for example, so I think that those those are kind of used interchangeably, but I think in the when we talk about it, it kind of means the same thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, will having COVID affect um, your next round of chemo in terms of your blood counts and energy levels? Very good question. Everyone's a little bit different in terms of the energy and how long COVID symptoms occur and the effects after that. Uh, in terms of blood counts, I think what I would say is that the clinic teams would likely need to ensure that the blood counts are adequate to proceed with the treatment as if you were not, did never had COVID, for example, because we do that routinely anyways before we administer chemotherapy is make sure the blood counts are good. 
So I think by having COVID doesn't necessarily mean that you would not be uh, ready in terms of blood counts. The fatigue, though, or any side effects that you may have had with COVID-19, sometimes some people last longer than others. So usually what I will say is that the clinics will assess the patient prior to the treatment being given to make sure that all those things are looked at to make sure it's safe for someone to get chemo their next round of chemotherapy after they've had COVID-19. Okay. And um, along that line, again, is how effective are the vaccines if someone has finished chemo in the last month or so? So yeah, that's a, another really good question. Um, so probably in that case, there's still some degree of immunocompromise likely. So the effectiveness may not be 100% the same, but it also depends on which chemotherapy, because some chemotherapy are more suppressive than others. So that's a really good question. I think probably the best thing to do in this case is have a discussion with the clinic team just to ask that question, because it'll be very dependent on what treatment was received as part of the treatment protocol. Okay. Um, so are rises in IgM levels linked to the COVID vaccine? That's a good question. Um, to be to be honest, I don't know the answer to that question. I I can't see why it would, but I don't want to say for sure that it's not. I I'm not entirely sure to be honest. Okay, that's fair, fair enough. No, that's great. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, so for those um, where Evusheld is not approved in their own province, um, yeah. what are the alternatives? I think it depends if it's pre or post exposure. For pre exposure, there's no other treatments that are indicated. For post exposure, it'll depend on the eligibility of the other treatments. You're right, every province is a little bit different in terms of what is available and what is not in the criteria, for example. So I think what I would probably say in those circumstances is you'll need to have a discussion with the, rather mm -hmm. the pharmacist or the clinic team to see what the options are, because it may be a little bit different in each province in terms of what's available. Okay, thank you. Um, so does Evusheld work for the BQ subvariants slash currently prominent variants? Um, they've read some mixed information on this and just wanted some input for clarity. Um, that's a, that's also very, all good questions that are coming here. Um, I'm not as well versed in terms of what the current situation is as compared to before. Okay. Um, so I, I probably would say I would need to research that in order to get the proper answer. Yeah. I'm happy to do that offline if I can contact you with that. I, I don't want to give the wrong answer, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't know on top of my head, to be honest. No, that's it. That's good. Thank you so much. Um, and we just have time for maybe two more questions here. Sure. Um, so if if uh, Evusheld is no longer um, a recommended treatment um, and appears not to be affected, effective to the newer Omicron variants, are there other treatments recommended? So the evidence is always evolving with regards to the treatments for COVID-19. So I think what I would suggest in this case is if the if there is COVID-19 that is diagnosed, the clinic team would likely need to discuss with you what your options are, uh, because some of it will also depend on renal function or your kidney function, for example. Um, so I think that would probably be what I would say is that if the diagnosis of the COVID-19 is positive, then the clinic team would need to discuss what the options are. Okay. And um, the last question, just the one um, that's all we really have time for. Um, any um, research on whether an annual COVID-19 vaccine will be required? That's also a very good question. The evidence is always being reviewed and ongoing with this. Um, right now. So right now the focus is on the bivalent vaccines. Um, so I think that that answer will be known in time. Uh, with re At this time next year, we should likely have an answer for that as the evidence is always evolving. 
Okay. Um, actually, I, I have time for one more question here. So, sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, does a, does immune globulin therapy protect against COVID? Uh, the immune globulin will likely be more important to prevent like, um, like bacterial infections, probably, I would say. So things like pneumonia. Okay. Um, and other type of infections. Um, but you, the immunoglobulins are usually um, monitored in the blood to see what you know how low they are. Um, but I think probably more importantly is things like the vaccine are probably in conjunction with probably is more important. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to just um, carry on and just um, thank you so much, uh, Mark, for your delivery today in this presentation. Um, I would like to acknowledge and thank Kim Dang for the creation of this presentation you heard today, which was so um, wonderfully delivered by Mark Gernart. Um, we would also like to thank AstraZeneca and Pfizer for their support in making this webcast possible. And um, if you can go to uh, the very, I think, last second last slide, Mark. Uh, please remember that we are here to help you. You can reach us by email, by visiting our website, bloodcancers.ca, or by calling toll free. Please note that a short survey will be sent to all participants after this presentation. Please take a moment to respond to help us plan more beneficial events for you in the near future. Thank you for being with us today and take good care of yourself.